Weird, right? My friend Ronnie grunted as we peered through the blinds of his bedroom. It was June of 1999, the start of summer vacation, and we just got back from seeing The Matrix in theaters. But the scene unfolding in the yard across the street was stranger than fiction. Ronnie's neighbor was mowing his lawn after midnight, dressed in a full suit and tie. With his wingtip shoes and slicked back hair, he looked like he'd walked straight out of the 1950s. The man whistled as he went, executing a graceful turn at the end of each perfectly trimmed row. Wilcox is gonna rip him a new over this, I muttered in awe. Amy Wilcox ruled the local homeowners association with an iron fist, and late night noise was her biggest pet peeve. Moments later, the woman herself was stomping down the sidewalk in her fluffy bathrobe and hair curlers, looking like a soldier on her way to an execution. I almost felt bad for Ronnie's neighbor, even though we'd never met. In fact, the only thing anyone knew about the family was the last name emblazoned on their mailbox, Lucerne. They hadn't answered their door once since they'd moved into the neighborhood, and according to Ronnie, they never went outside during the day. Down below, the most feared woman in the neighborhood stood squarely in front of the strange man and his lawnmower. No matter how much she stomped her foot and wagged her finger, his expression didn't change. I shuddered. The strange man's face seemed more like a mask for something else. Suddenly, Ronnie's neighbor crossed the 20 feet that separated him from Amy Wilcox in a single step. She stared up at him like a puppet with its strings cut. He pointed toward the front door of the Lucerne house and it seemed to swing open on its own. There was only darkness on the other side. Amy Wilcox walked into the Lucerne house like a sleepwalker, her feet dragging like they were moving on their own. After the door slammed shut behind her, the strange man turned to admire his night's work. Although there was no way he could have seen us, he suddenly looked straight into Ronnie's window and waved. It was the beginning of our obsession with the Lucernes. The next morning, I woke in a puddle of sweat, still queasy from nightmares I couldn't remember. Well, not entirely, just flashes. A well-trimmed lawn in the moonlight, that pale smiling face with eyes like black pits. The Lucerne's front door creaking open and darkness on the other side. My hand flew to my mouth to clamp down a wave of nausea. Maybe it was better not to remember. I had to get out of the house. The sun still hadn't come up, but the streetlights had gone out. It was chilly for June, but I didn't care. The cool felt good on my face and chased away the strange memories of the night before, at least until I saw the dark figure coming toward me down the sidewalk. Whoever it was walked like a drunk, staggering from side to side. It was Amy Wilcox. I usually did my best to avoid the snarky middle-aged woman who always had some backhanded comment to make about my hair, my friends, or my music. But on that morning, I ran straight toward her. Mrs. Wilcox? I asked. It looked like the homeowners association president had aged 10 years in a matter of hours. Her skin stretched thin over her bony frame. Her hair had gone from gray to white, and it was clear from her slack-jawed expression that she had no idea where she was. Mrs. Wilcox, are you all right? I repeated. A drool formed in the corner of Amy Wilcox's lips, and she opened and closed her mouth wordlessly. I reached out to steady her, afraid she was going to fall over. No, I can't give any more. I don't want to. Stop! Amy Wilcox slapped my hand away. Her eyes were white with terror. As I backed away, her vision came back into focus. Hey! You're that Juarez kid. Amy Wilcox said my family name with a sneer. A few years ago, our kind wouldn't have been allowed to live in her neighborhood. What are you doing out so early in the morning, hmm? Not coming back from someplace you shouldn't have been, I hope. Maybe I should just call your parents just in case. I was sprinting home before she could finish. Amy Wilcox clearly had no memory of the night she'd spent in the Lucerne's house. And the last thing I needed was for her to blame her sickening transformation on me and my family. As it turned out, I didn't have to worry. Amy Wilcox never fully recovered from whatever had happened to her that night. The fines for improperly parked cars 
and poorly chosen fence colors disappeared from our mailboxes. She even stepped down as head of the homeowners association. The most anyone saw of her was a hunched over shadow behind the lace curtains of the biggest house in the neighborhood. The next evening, Ronnie and I met up in a small city park a few blocks away. We discovered that it was possible to get onto the roof of the equipment shed by climbing the gutter and that the shed roof was a near perfect place to smoke a joint and watch the sun set behind the trees. As I stretched my back and inhaled, Ronnie handed me a small red notebook. What? What's this? I sputtered. That? Ronnie responded triumphantly. Is everything we know about the Lucernes. Pfft, you're obsessed, I scoffed. And then I started to read. Chapter two. I felt my stomach twist into a knot as I read through Ronnie's chicken scratch list. This was happening right here on our street. And as far as I could tell, Ronnie and I were the only ones who had noticed that anything was wrong. Point one, the Lucerne house must have a huge basement or several basements. We had moved to the neighborhood around the same time as the Lucernes, and we saw five huge moving vans that unloaded their contents into the Lucernes' small ranch house. There was no way that all that old junk could fit into a one-story home. Everything from antique mirrors to Turkish carpets and four poster beds. Massive framed paintings, hand-carved wooden wardrobes, a grand piano, and even a jukebox. A few hours before dawn the next morning, we heard another moving truck idling outside the Lucerne house, but we couldn't say for sure exactly what had been unloaded from that one. Point two, since we don't know how big the Lucerne house is on the inside, we also can't know how many residents live there. Ronnie had seen three for sure, the man with the 50 style suit and haircut who cut the grass also nicknamed the greaser, a woman in a white dress and sun hat who took care of the garden, the housewife, and a pudgy preteen boy who took care of cleaning and repairs, the stooge. There were probably more, Ronnie admitted, but since he couldn't stay up every night watching for them, there was no way to be sure. Point three, regardless of how many of them there are, the Lucernes don't have the same needs as the rest of us. No one had ever seen anyone from the Lucerne house drive, go to work, or go shopping. They didn't host any barbecues, holiday celebrations, or other social events. They didn't even seem to need light. Point four, bad things happen to people who get close to the Lucernes, and Amy Wilcox isn't the first. Ronnie had asked around about the Lucerne house, and apparently the original owner, one Sam Hollenfeld, had died under mysterious circumstances. According to the mail carrier, Sam had just wasted away. The doctors were never able to figure out what was wrong. Five days later, he was dead. The phrase wasted away made me think of Amy Wilcox's too stretched skin and milky eyes. The way she screamed, no, I can't give anymore, stop, while in her trance. I shuddered at the thought. Point five, if we don't figure out what's going on soon, we might be next. The greaser had waved at us, which meant the Lucernes knew that we were watching. Maybe they considered us a threat. Maybe it was just a matter of time before Ronnie and I ended up like Amy Wilcox or Sam Hollenfeld. Ronnie had been staring intently at me while I read through his notes. Well, he asked finally, what do you think? I think you spent more effort on this than you ever have on your homework. <laughs> this isn't funny, Ronnie moaned. Didn't you read what I wrote? Yeah, I did. And that's why I don't want to stick my nose any further into this than I already have. Okay, sure, the Lucernes are weird and maybe even dangerous. Up until that point, I agree with you. But the worst thing we could do is draw their attention even more by poking around in their business. I spread my arms wide, indicating the balmy night, the fireflies, the glow of our joint in the dark. My man, it is summer. Next year will be our senior year. And who knows where we'll be after that? Let's enjoy it while we can, huh? The truth was, I was more afraid of my future after high school than I was afraid of the Lucernes. But I wasn't about to tell Ronnie that. Yeah, I guess you're right, Ronnie grunted. He didn't sound convinced. I just wish I knew what the fuck was going on inside that house. A few hours later, our friends Kira and Taylor pulled up to the park 
in a busted up 86 Cadillac with Enter Sandman blaring from its one working speaker. We're gonna go for a drive, wanna come? Kira shouted to us. I agreed before Ronnie could say no. I secretly hoped that it would take his mind off the Lucerne's. He shot me an irritated glance, but came along anyway, taking swigs from his father's whiskey flask as he went. With nothing to do and no place to go, we drove down the back roads, hill hopping, investigating abandoned farmhouses with a shaky flashlight, and finally sharing some midnight soft serve in a Dairy Queen parking lot. Ronnie asked Kira to drop us off at the entrance to our neighborhood. It was only after her taillights had faded into the gathering fog that I realized Ronnie and I would have to walk past the Lucerne house to get home. Grayish mist was rolling in fast. It made the streetlights look like will-o'-wisps and the fog thickened until Ronnie and I could barely see 10 feet in front of our faces. On a night like this, you could get away with almost anything, Ronnie commented with a grin. There was a look in his eyes that I didn't like at all. What do you mean? I grunted. A telltale sloshing sound stopped me in my tracks. Ronnie was finishing off what was left of the whiskey in his father's flask. Now I realized why he'd been so loose-lipped and easygoing all night. He'd been sneaking sips in the back of the car while I wasn't looking. He must have polished off more than half a bottle. Who knows when we'll get another chance like this? Ronnie shook my shoulders unsteadily. We can walk up to the Lucernes' windows and look right in. One, you're drunk. And two, that's nuts. No way. I'm going home, Ronnie. It's like 4 a.m. Fine, but I'm doing it. With or without you. Ronnie tried to stomp off into the fog, but he was too tipsy to even stay on the sidewalk. If he made a noise or got caught, first I thought of flashing red and blue lights and Ronnie's already slim chances of a future after graduation getting even slimmer. Then I thought of that black door that opened like a hungry mouth and what happened to Amy Wilcox after she went inside. Okay, okay, I groaned. Look, how about I sneak up to the window and then tell you what I see, deal? Ronnie pretended to complain, but I had a feeling that he planned this all along. As I tiptoed across the Lucerne's lawn, my irritation at getting hoodwinked by Ronnie was slowly replaced by fear. With the fog so close around me, it was like the rest of the world had stopped existing. All that was left was perfectly cut grass and a silence that felt too heavy to be natural. After what felt like forever, I reached the Lucerne's dark front window and pressed my face against the glass. I was almost disappointed when I saw nothing more than the shadowy outline of a normal suburban living room. Carpeted floor, recliners, a couch, a television, and bookshelves. The longer I looked, however, the more something felt off about the image. Until finally I understood. I was looking at a blown up photograph that had been stuck to the window. Whatever was behind the uncanny fake picture was anyone's guess. But the fog had begun to lift and I needed to get moving. Running footsteps came charging up from behind me in the misty dark. I winced, ready for anything. Ronnie tackled me into the wet grass and pressed a finger to his lips. Shh, he hissed. I kept my mouth shut as he helped me to my feet and led me back toward the street. And that's when I saw it. It looked just like a short man in old fashioned clothes with one of those bowler hats perched on its head until it got close to a house. Then its arms, legs, and neck stretched hideously until it was peering into the windows of the sleeping residence. Ronnie and I scurried behind a nearby fence and watched with horror as the nightmarish thing inspected house after house. Each time, it returned to the form of an ordinary man with a blank expression and an old-fashioned hat before moving on, never seeming to find what it was looking for. I got the horrible impression that it was hoping to see some poor, sleepless soul staring out the window into the night. The moment it saw them, it would rip open their window, reach inside with its freakishly stretched fingers, and then, finally, it reached a home with an old-fashioned chimney. The thing wrapped its hideously elongated body around the chimney, then slithered into it like a nightmare Santa Claus. Ronnie and I looked at each other, wanting to run, but were too petrified to move. What if it popped its head back out and saw us? 
I was about to tell Ronnie we should make a break for it when the stretched man reappeared on the neighbor's roof. It crawled back down onto the street, wiping blood from its lips as it went. It was only two houses away now. If it passed by the bushes where Ronnie and I were squatting, we were doomed for sure. Suddenly, the thing turned left and crossed the road. Neither of us were surprised to see it walk into the Lucerne house. Chapter three. After seeing the stretched man, I thought I'd never be able to sleep again, at least not without covering up every window in the house. But I dozed off the moment my head hit the pillow. I woke up with a hot sunbeam hitting my face, a pounding in my ears, and a bad headache. Get out here, mister! My father's voice boomed as his fist connected with my bedroom door again and again. You got some serious explaining to do. Mister, I groaned. The last time my father had called me that, I'd been drawing on the walls with the crayon. As I pulled on a pair of pants, I clutched my aching head and wondered what the hell this could be about. There was a man at our door, a chubby, middle-aged white guy with manicured nails and a three-piece blue suit that actually had one of those golden watch chains hanging from it. He asked me by my name. Uh, yeah, I answered. I could feel my father staring daggers into my back. My name is Terence Wilkes. I represent the law firm Schloss, Levy, and Wilkes. I'm here on behalf of my clients, the Lucerne family. My heart sank. The lawyer held out a set of pristine photos. Ronnie and I chugging alcohol on the sidewalk, me creeping through the Lucernes' yard, my face pressed against their window. Terence Wilkes looked at me with a malicious glint in his eye. Trespassing with intent to steal and underage drinking are serious offenses. The sort of offenses that can destroy a young person's future. Behind me, my father's anger had turned to desperation. He put an arm around me. How, uh, how can we make it right? He asked. The lawyer smiled at me. All my clients ask for is an apology. If you present yourself at the Lucerne home between 9 and 10 p.m. this evening and explain your actions, they are willing to forget the incident for now. Otherwise, my clients have every intention of pressing charges. What? I moaned. Go to their house? No way. He'll be there, my father said flatly. My clients will be looking forward to it, I'm sure. There was something evil about that grin. I could feel it. The neat little man turned to go. Good day. My parents were screaming in my face the moment the door closed, grounding me until after graduation. But their shouts didn't frighten me nearly as much as Ronnie's silence when I gave him a secret call that afternoon. Don't go, my old friend said finally. No matter what. I don't have a choice, I whined. Don't ruin my life if I don't. At least you'll have a life, Ronnie snapped. Listen, there's something I haven't told you. Static blasted in my ear. I pulled the phone and was confronted by my father's furious face. No phones for you, mister. Bedroom, now. I stormed upstairs. There was nothing to do but stare at the wall and wonder what would happen at 9 p.m. At 8.55, I was walking up the Lucernes' driveway in a hideous suit that I hadn't worn since my grandfather's funeral. I tugged on the two small sleeves as I rang the bell. I guess the way the door opened by itself was meant to freak me out. It worked. Hello? I whispered to the darkness. I looked over my shoulder. My parents stood on the porch, hands on their hips, waiting for me to go into the Lucerne house. Come in! A too cheerful male voice called from inside. I gulped and stepped forward. The temperature in the Lucerne house seemed about 20 degrees colder than the humid summer air outside. I would have seen my breath if I could have seen anything at all. Something about the echo of my footsteps told me the room was empty and much bigger than it seemed. The front door slammed shut behind me. I spun. Don't be afraid, the cheerful voice went on. And don't get turned around. Walk straight ahead and you'll be just fine. Who are you people? Why are you doing this to me? I shouted into the blackness. My voice echoed like I was yelling into an enormous cave. But there was no response. 
I'd been walking for what felt like forever when I heard a giggle beside me. I froze, (laughs) my heart in my throat. Something big in the blackness beside me shifted its heavy weight and burbled like a baby blowing bubbles. It was huge and it was coming closer. What had the man said? Walk straight ahead, you'll be fine. I decided to trust him. It wasn't like I had a choice. After what felt like forever, my outstretched hands collided with an old fashioned door. I reached out for a knob, afraid of what I might touch instead. The door swung open, then closed behind me. My heartbeat felt loud in the silence. Take a seat, young man. The voice came from just inches away. I stumbled backwards into a carved wood and velvet chair fit for a king. The floor creaked as whoever had been speaking to me circled around the chair. Now, why don't you tell us all why you've come here? Us all? Just how many of them were in here with me, watching me? I'm, uh, here to apologize for trespassing. It was wrong, and I won't do it again. You misunderstand me. The jovial voice was suddenly cold. The question is, why are you spying on our family? My breath got caught in my throat as long, cold fingers dug into my shoulders, pinning me to the chair. They were sinking into my skin. That hurts, I gasped. Not as much as it's going to, the voice replied cheerfully. Who sent you? Nobody, I grunted. Me and my friend, we were just drunk. We wondered about this place, because you don't ever go outside and, ah! They hit my pressure points perfectly. The pain was unbearable. That's right, young man. We don't go out during the day, but you do. And that's how you'll repay your debt to us. The impaling fingers were suddenly gone. What? I gasped. Someone or something is hunting us. And you are a part of it somehow. I can taste it. That's why you'll be our eyes and ears in the daylight world, keeping watch for any threats. You'll report on anything you find, no matter how insignificant it might seem. Your excuse will be that you've agreed to do some work around the house as penance for your trespasses. I imagined having to come back to this horrible, lightless room and a jolt of fear and anger shot through me. Why should I? This is but one of the ways we can collect your debt to us. I assure you, it is the gentlest way. I felt something coarse and stringy being pressed into my hand by those long, old fingers. If you agree, Come by after sunset tomorrow with your first report. If not, the voice trailed off. You may go. I stood on trembling legs and staggered toward the exit, then went out the front door. It was easier to find my way the second time, and the distances didn't seem so long. I couldn't help but wonder if it had all been some cruel trick, some insane game that my crazy neighbors were playing until I was standing beneath the streetlights outside. I looked down at what the Lucernes had given me, a tuft of curly, blackish gray hair that I recognized, my father's hair. This is but one of the ways we can collect your debt, the voice had said. I shuddered, realizing the deal I'd accepted. I was about to become a spy for the Lucernes. Chapter four. I gazed out the window at the lightless house across the street, wondering how the hell I could find something to tell the Lucernes. If my information wasn't good, would they hurt my family instead? I had a sickening feeling that if I made something up, they'd know it. To make matters worse, I was grounded, stuck in my room for three straight weeks. I was going to spend the best days of summer doing what? Staring at the Lucerne house? Maybe their plan was to bore me to death. As the days dragged past, however, I began to recognize certain patterns in the world outside my window. Like old Mr. Kovacs, who always took his Doberman for a walk between 6 and 8 a.m. He always stopped for a few minutes in front of the Lucerne house, although that may have just been because his dog always pulled him toward the place, barking its head off. Probably not a threat. Then there were the three cars that rotated from one day to another, an old green SUV, a white Hyundai, and a blue Ford Focus. The driver was always the same, a handsome businessman with wavy salt and pepper hair. He always parked at the end of the street around lunchtime, stayed for two or three hours, then drove away. 
That was plenty suspicious. But if his goal was to hunt the lucernes, why all the flowers and chocolates? A carelessly left open window finally showed me what was really going on. Claire Stetfield from two houses down was cheating on her marine husband with a mysterious visitor. Until the night of the storm, I was worried that I'd have nothing to report back to the Lucernes. The sky was so gray and ominous that afternoon, it felt like the sun had set early. A wild wind buffeted the trees and made the streetlights flicker, but there was no end to the dark claw-like clouds dragging across the sky. Suddenly, around midnight, a deluge of rain poured down out of the sky, and a short chap in a bowler hat strolled out of the Lucerne house, the stretched man. As it walked toward the house with the chimney, I realized that it wasn't alone. A figure in a yellow raincoat was speed walking down the sidewalk toward it. Apparently, it had been a long time since the stretched man had been out, and it was hungry. It was already elongating itself, its arms grotesquely extending toward my neighbor's house. Yellow Raincoat ducked the attack and climbed the stretched man's body before plunging some kind of weapon into its chest. The stretched man toppled like a fallen tree. It let out one last wheezing moan before melting into a foul black goo. Yellow Raincoat watched the whole process, hood up, as if to make sure the stretched man was really gone. Once the storm had washed all that was left of the black goo, Yellow Raincoat wiped off their mysterious weapon and walked calmly away. I might not have liked it, but now I had something to report to the Lucernes. Son? My father's voice cut through my troubled dreams like a whiplash. Son, can you open your window? I tossed and turned for hours, unable to sleep after the gruesome sight, and I wasn't at all sure that the voice I heard wasn't just another dream or a nightmare. Why would my father want me to open the window in the middle of the night in a rainstorm? Come on, son. You've got to hurry. Without bothering with the blinds, I flung my second story window open. A pale hand slipped underneath. I was flung against the wall in a burst of blackness. They killed him. The frizzy-haired girl in front of me snarled. I'd never seen her before in my life. The bastards killed Marius. Who? Who are you? I stammered. The girl rolled her bright green eyes. I have many names, she said in my mother's voice. But, she went on, switching to my father's gruff tone. You can call me Amanda Lucerne. Her last words were hers again, the voice of a girl around my own age. She wore a plain black dress that had gone out of style around 1850 and wireframe glasses as round as the full moon. The others didn't want to trust a daywalker, but I convinced them otherwise. Now, what did you see? I told Amanda Lucerne everything. When I got to the part about Marius, the stretched man, getting stabbed in the chest, a single crimson tear ran down her cheek. It left a bloody smear when she wiped it away. You have to find whoever did this, she sniffed, moving closer to me until our faces were just inches apart. This isn't even about our survival anymore. It's about revenge. Do you have any idea how many people own a plain yellow raincoat? What do you need? Money? Amanda Lucerne shoved a fistful of huge gold coins into my hand. Here, take it. What else? I, uh, actually just need my parents to let me out of the house. Amanda paused, confused, then smiled. It'll be taken care of. Thank you for inviting me in. Inviting you in? I wondered aloud. You opened your window for me, and that invitation is good forever. Remember that. Amanda Lucerne spun transformed into something like a cloud of black smoke and disappeared out my half-open window. I knew I'd never get back to sleep. My heart was pounding too fast. I checked the clock, 3.03 a.m. Only one person I knew might still be awake at this hour, Ronnie. It was time to see if Amanda Lucerne could make good on her promise to keep my parents out of my way. I dressed for the stormy weather and trudged downstairs expecting my father to burst out of his bedroom at any minute and demand to know what I was doing. But he just went on sleeping peacefully. The rain had stopped, leaving the grass wet and intensely green beneath the streetlights. As I jogged to Ronnie's house, I wondered if Amanda's gold coins might be enough to buy us a graduation road trip after all this was over. The eerie blue light of a computer screen glowed in Ronnie's window. I knew it. 
I whistled twice, our signal to answer the door after hours. Moments later, Ronnie stood backlit on his porch, but he didn't look happy to see me. In fact, he looked exhausted. What's up, man? My old friend mumbled. I thought you were grounded. Not anymore, he grinned. Oh yeah? What happened? Ronnie asked suspiciously. Don't tell me you went into the Lucerne house. I warned you. It's a long story, I shrugged. But look at me, I'm just fine. I mean, throw holy water or salt on me if you feel like you have to. There's no need, you aren't one of them. How can you be so sure, I teased. Ronnie didn't reply. My old friend leaned on the door frame, like he was waiting for me to leave. Uh, can I come in? Ronnie went back inside, not even bothering to check if I was following or not. What was his problem? And we'd been talking so loudly on the porch. Wasn't he worried about his parents waking up? That's when I noticed the yellow raincoat hanging behind the door. It was still wet. Now that you've gone into their house, we have to assume you're compromised. You're useless to us now, Ronnie muttered. You might as well go home. Uh, Ronnie? What the fuck are you talking about? I was disturbed by my old friend's attitude that I hadn't noticed his door had slammed shut on its own. Ronnie this, Ronnie that. I've had it with Ronnie. Ronnie is gone, lad. He has been for a long time and he won't be coming back. As he spoke, he changed. Instead of the pimply teenage metalhead with long black hair who I thought I knew, I was looking at a plump, middle-aged guy with just a few wisps of ginger hair on his bald head and cruel blue eyes. There was something sickening about this stranger in Ronnie's clothes. Who the fuck are you? I screamed. What did you do to my friend? I backed into the doorknob and twisted. It was locked tight. And I knew by now that no adults in the house would be coming to my rescue. A few lives. The stranger in front of me spat through crooked yellow teeth. It's a small price to pay to stop those creatures. I hope you understand. That's when I noticed what he held in his hand. A wood and silver tool that looked like a mix of a cross, a stake, and a butcher knife. He held out a veiny hand, pulling me into his grasp. I shut my eyes as he raised his freakish weapon. A black cloud blasted the door off its hinges. Amanda Lucerne flung a coffee table into the imposter, disarming him. Get his necklace! She hissed at me. My hands obeyed before I knew what I was doing. I felt around the imposter's neck and grabbed a silver chain. I yanked it off and kicked him in the chest. He flew backwards and hit the floor. And then Amanda was on him. I didn't exactly see what she did to the imposter, but I did see the blood splatter high on the ceiling. When it was all over, Amanda placed her palm in the center of the gruesome pool, seeming to drink in his blood with the tips of her fingers. Minutes later, it was gone. What? What the hell? I panted. Your friend hasn't been your friend for a long time, Amanda sighed. This hunter took his place. He wanted to use you to draw us out. Do you remember when things started to change? Weird, right? Ronnie had said, when he'd first pointed out the window at the Lucernes mowing their lawn after midnight. But how had he known to look out the window that specific night at that specific time? At the moment, it didn't even occur to me. The start of summer vacation, I guess, I admitted. Ronnie was always an obsessive sort of guy. First it was Doom, then cheesy movies, then Metallica. I thought that your, uh, family was one of his obsessions. I looked at the desiccated body of the stranger on the floor. What happens now? Your authorities will want to investigate what happened here, but the hunter will have hid the bodies well. They'll never be found. I'll take care of the other evidence. And as for you? Amanda crossed her arms and cocked her head at me. You'll continue to keep an eye on the other daywalkers for us, won't you? I touched the bruises that the hunter's fingers had left on my neck. Whatever else Amanda Lucerne was, she'd probably just saved my life. I nodded. Back then, I thought when I left town for college five states away, the Lucernes would forget about me or replace me with someone else. Imagine my surprise when Amanda walked out of my dorm room closet one rainy night during my junior year. One of my classmates was a hunter in training, Amanda said, and she needed me to set a trap for him. I moved again, another city, another continent. It didn't matter. The Lucernes always found more work for their daywalker spy. As Amanda had said, 
I'd invited her into my life once, and that invitation was good forever. I'd like to tell her I'm getting too old for this, but I doubt she'd understand. Because in the past 24 years, Amanda Lucerne hasn't aged a day. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.